Good afternoon and welcome to Christie's. My name is Peter Clarnett. I am Senior Specialist in Americana Books and Manuscripts here at Christie's Books Department. Uh, today we are here to discuss the, uh, the birth of Wikipedia and its future, which is part of a two lot online sale we currently have uh, closing December 15th. Uh, which includes the iMac that Jimmy Wales used to uh, in, during the creation of Wikipedia, as well as interactive NFT that evokes the first moment uh, that Wikipedia came in existence on 15th January 2001. Uh, here to discuss all things Wikipedia and free culture and open source are two pioneers of this movement. Uh, first, we'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Lawrence Lessing, who is Roy Furman Professor of Law and Leadership at Harvard Le Law School. Uh, he is the founder of Equal Citizens and a founding board member of Creative Commons. Um, apart from his uh, many, many uh, uh, distinguished affiliations, uh, The New Yorker has cited him as quote, the most important critical thinker on intellectual property in the internet era. Also joining me is the man of the hour, Mr. Jimmy Wales, co-founder of Wikipedia, and uh, one of the, also one of the most influential people in the internet today. Uh, Jimmy is here to tell us a little bit more about you know, the, those early moments and, um, and the birth of Wikipedia. Um, but I think the first question I wanted to bring up in terms of you know, just framing around this discussion is why I have both of you here. And, one of the most interesting things that I found out that not only was Wikipedia launched on 15th January 2001, uh, it also marked the birth of Creative Commons. Uh, Larry Lessig, I believe you had filed the corporate paperwork for Creative Commons. So perhaps we can discuss a little bit more about that connection. I don't believe you two knew each other at the time and how it's relevant to Wikipedia and how it's relevant to uh, to the internet in general, in terms, especially in terms of this very decentralized future. Well, I mean, let me start with that. Um, I think what that evinces is, is that we were both thinking about how to make sure that there would be an aspect of culture that was freely accessible and you could build upon it without worrying about the law. Jimmy did it much more generatively and um, successfully. Um, I was more the lawyer trying to think about how do we build the legal infrastructure to make that possible. Um, and so we launched on the same, we, we filed for incorporation the same day Wikipedia launched, um, but we didn't launch our licenses, which have become the core of Creative Commons until the end of 2020, uh, uh, 2002. So we will have our own 20th anniversary celebration of that at the end of, uh, in December of 2002. But um, um, Jimmy and I, I think, first had our first email shortly after Wikipedia launched. I was extremely excited to see that. And we tried to connect about what, what was possible. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, you know, Wikipedia, the, the idea of Wikipedia really uh, grew out of watching the growth of the free software movement. So open source software, as most people call it. And seeing, you know, programmers coming together, collaborating, uh, sharing their work freely, and really, um, you know, all the software that is the fundamental backbone of the internet is still open source software. And, uh, you know, so GNU Linux and MySQL and PHP and, you know, all, all the different languages and frameworks and things like that. And I realized from watching that, that, you know, that kind of collaboration, it's, it's natural that that came first from programmers because if they wanted to have tools to share work with each other, they could make their own tools. But for the rest of us to share our work, uh, particularly back then, I mean, the best you could do was email around Word documents and things like that. It wasn't, there wasn't really a great way of doing it. And I realized that an encyclopedia would be uh, like the easiest thing to collaborate on. So actually two years before Wikipedia, I started a project called Newpedia, uh, but I didn't know about wikis and I didn't know about how to build a community and things like that. So Newpedia didn't work. And actually in the Newpedia area, we, we really struggled with those legal questions, you know, when you looked at software, uh, there's the GNU GPL and the MIT license, and you know, there's a, there's a whole range of uh, licensing options that already existed. And if you looked at those and you tried to apply them to an encyclopedia, they didn't really make sense. They weren't really designed for that. So we we settled in those early days on the closest thing we could find, which was the GNU free documentation license, 
which when you read it, you know, it's sort of applied, but it talked about the, the, the preface of the book. And, you know, it really was about a printed computer manual. And so you realize like, actually this license isn't quite right either. And, um, you know, we were really struggling to figure out um, how do we make a legal, you know, we want to do this the right way and we don't want to make up our own random license. We're not even lawyers. Um, and so that's really how the relationship between Creative Commons and Wikipedia was forged very, very early on. And then we went through this very long process to um, transition from the free documentation license to uh, the Creative Commons license that we use today. And, and following up on that, Larry, how do you um, now that we're you know twenty years on with Creative Commons, uh, what, uh, how would you measure the impact that you've had uh, in terms of copyright on the internet? What what fundamental you know impact has it had over the past de two decades? Well, I think you know the objective of Creative Commons was to give a name to an idea that people already had, um, and the idea that people had was in the in the way copyright was framed circa 1998, um, it was as if there was just the all rights reserved crowd, the kind of Jack Valenti Hollywood uh, crowd, and the no rights respected crowd, people who said copyright's theft and we shouldn't respect anybody's copyright and pirate whatever you can. And what, what I knew as an academic, I think what many creators knew is that there was a position between those two extremes. It was a position of people who were creators, authors, musicians, who wanted to enable their work to be shared freely, um, um, sometimes for commercial purposes, but sometimes not. But there was no simple way to signal that. And so the original idea of Creative Commons licenses was a simple way to mark your creative work with the freedoms you intended to carry, um, as opposed to the standard uh, C mark, which says, you know, call my lawyer before you want to do anything with this work. Um, and, and so that idea, I think, at the time Jimmy and I were you know, founding our different organizations, um, that idea was latent in the culture, I think. And once, we, once Creative Commons named it, there was all sorts of people who were like, aha, yes, of course, that's what we're thinking about. And so museums and academic journals and many remix uh, musicians who were taking and building on work of others said, yeah, this is exactly the infrastructure we need to do the kind of creative work that we want to do. And, and that's all we wanted to be. We wanted to be plumbing company, you know, that provided uh, the pipes that enabled people to, to do their work without having to worry about, um, you know, the legal implication of what they might happen to do. One of the things that the, the free licensing does for people when you're talking about collaborative works or remix culture and things like that, is it just allows you to set aside a lot of pretty intractable problems of cooperation. So if I decide, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write a new piece of software and I'd like to get other people to help me with it. And all we have at our disposal is traditional copyright, then people are gonna be not sure like, okay, but why would we give you our stuff uh, for free if you're just gonna turn around and sell it and not give us any of the money. But if you have a license and, and there are different many different types, types of Creative Commons license. But if you have a license that says, no, actually, um, you know, you can, you can make derivative copies, anybody can copy it, anybody can, can change it, then suddenly all of our coordination problems go away. Like if I contribute to your project and I don't like what you're doing with it, that's okay, I can just take and go in a different direction myself. And if you start to sell it for money, okay, that's fine, but I can sell it for money as well. And so that just makes a lot of really hard questions for small group collaboration just kind of go away, particularly when the project isn't one that you really have a commercial motive for in the first place, um, you know, that it's really an artistic concept or a community project or something like that. Now to maybe move on a little bit, and I think Lawrence, you've already answered this question to a certain extent, but uh, more for Jimmy, when you've first started out, you know, Wikipedia, it was, it was more nominally a feeder project for Newpedia, obviously came, uh, took on its life of its own. Uh, but looking at it now, uh, would you have, did you have any expectation that it would have ballooned to the en enormous size? I mean, we're talking about something of the rivals, you know, it's better, bigger than the Library of Alexandria in many respects, it's the largest reference yeah. ever assembled by man. 
<laughs> so, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I, what I always answer that with is by saying I'm, I'm a pathological optimist. So I always think everything's gonna be great. So uh, at the time I, I looked around uh, on the internet and I saw like an encyclopedia reference type of site that was ranked number 50 on the internet. And I thought if we did a really great job, we might make it into the top 100, uh, maybe the top 50, it could be very exciting. Um, obviously now Wikipedia is the fifth most popular website and is, um, you know, it's, I, I mean, I don't think there's any other way to describe it than it's part of the infrastructure of society. Um, you know, we all use it and, and depend on it and rely on it and hopefully understand its weaknesses as well as its strengths. Um, and so in, in one sense, yes, I, I thought this could be great. Uh, in another sense, no, there was no way to really fathom, um, you know, what, what it would mean to the world and how it could, could grow to this size and the impact that it would have. I mean, one of the things that was uh, amusing about it all is at the time, uh, it was very popular for people to say, wow, everybody is going to work on the internet. And uh, so people are gonna leave the cities and just all move to this countryside and nobody has to see each other anymore. <laughs> and, and I thought, yeah, like we can collaborate globally without actually being in person. And then I spent, you know, about 20 years traveling the entire world all the time, uh, because it turns out you do have to meet people and see people and do things. Uh, obviously now we've maybe transitioned a little bit. Here we are on Zoom. We wouldn't have been doing this uh, even three years ago, I think. Um, so maybe we can all move to the countryside now, but, uh, but, you know, that thinking about the future, I mean, some of the kinds of impacts that I didn't consider, I remember uh, several years ago, I was in the Dominican Republic and uh, sort of speaking at a conference and the, they wanted to show me uh, a project locally where they were building computer labs in very, very poor communities. So they took me out and in this really, you know, sort of dirt roads and uh, they had only had um, electricity, uh, legal electricity. I think they had pirated some electricity before that, but for about two or three years. So they put in electricity into this, you know, shanty town and they built a very nice computer center and the kids were all in there um, and they were doing things kids do everywhere. They were on YouTube and they were, they had mobile phones and they were on Wikipedia and they were pretty amazed to see me there. Um, and I thought, you know, this is really interesting. So we're talking about a, a community where three years prior, they didn't have electricity. And now suddenly these kids were growing up with literally the world at their fingertips, with Wikipedia at their fingertips. And that's pretty phenomenal. Um, and I, I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm still of that, uh, despite all the problems we see with social networking and things that are going on bad today, I'm still of that very um, utopian uh, mindset that, gee, actually now that this community has access to the internet, they can actually get themselves organized in new ways and campaign that maybe they're gonna be able to get these roads paved uh, in their neighborhood. Maybe they're not gonna be sort of neglected as a slum anymore because they'll be able to, to sort of do interesting new things and they'll be empowered by knowledge and so forth. And I still think that's true. I mean, obviously we've got a lot of problems uh, these days in the world and on the internet. But I still think that fundamental uh, impact, so not just of Wikipedia, but of all this kind of thinking of what does it mean for, you know, the, the, the vision of Wikipedia is a free encyclopedia for every single person on the planet. Uh, that's like core to everything we do. What does that really mean? What, what kind of power does that put into people's hands who may, you know, 20, 30 years ago have had no possibility of getting such information? And that still motivates me every day. Peter, can I, I, I just want to emphasize a point that Jimmy um, <clears throat> might, might hesitate to, to take credit for. There are two architectural features of Wikipedia that I think are absolutely critical to its success. And by contrast, we can see much of the problems with the rest of the internet right now. And one feature is the norm of neutrality which is at the center of what Wikipedia does, which means the writers of Wikipedia adopt a framework in their mind as they're writing. Their objective is to write in a way that respects all sides, doesn't necessarily have to agree with all sides, but the point is it has to frame it in a way that presents it as neutral. The sort of thing we used to think news stations did when they told us the news, but of course they don't do that anymore at all, or at least some, um, but that's at the core of Wikipedia, number one. And number two, 
really an extraordinary decision, which I know was fought over for many, many years, there's no advertising on Wikipedia, which means that Wikipedia doesn't serve pages that it knows will excite the reader. Like it's not keen to like get you to the most incendiary parts of Wikipedia because it knows that will commit you to watching Wikipedia the way Facebook's platform or the AI and Facebook's platform feeds incendiary information to people on Facebook's newsfeed because it knows it just gets them engaged more. There's no conflict of interest in Wikipedia between um, its business model and presenting the truth in a fair and balanced way. And that fact, I think we should think a lot about when we reflect on what's wrong with the rest of uh, uh, media, social media, as well as regular media. Um, and we learn a lot, I think, if we figure out how this, you know, I, I, it's an interesting story. I've never heard Jimmy tell it fully, but how these two core values became part of what they thought Wikipedia would be. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree completely. I mean, certainly, you know, on the neutrality point, just, just to make, make the point, um, this is even prior to all the algorithmic stuff, which we deal with now. It's quite easy to see how, okay, you come to Wikipedia and you're reading about Queen Elizabeth I. Frankly, in that moment, there is almost nothing to sell you, right? Um, maybe a book, you know, but you're probably, you know, there's, there, it's not a very good commercial moment. And if we were any other type of platform, we would have to start thinking about, okay, how do we move you along from that? to things that might get you in the mood to buy something so that we can put ads on that are actually productive of commerce. Nowadays, we know um, how uh, sort of insidious those algorithms can be um, at, at getting you to do things, uh, tempting you to, to click on something and so forth. And so, you know, it's made a huge difference. And it also, I, one of the things I always say about uh, the, this topic is I, I think business model drives all organizations to an outcome. And I don't, I'm not talking about for-profit versus non-profit in this instance. I'm talking about, you know, Wikipedia could be a non-profit that has ads to raise money. That's not something that's impossible to do. But if we were ad-driven, then eventually, no matter what principles we started with at the Wikimedia Foundation to say, we're gonna be neutral and all that, people start looking at the revenue and you know people care about their jobs and they'd like to expand their department and, and all organizations tend to do it. It'd be very hard to fight against uh, doing things that would boost revenue. Um, whereas in our case, for example, showing you more ads, just keeping you on the site longer, right? Um, and, and, and you know I think we've all seen the, uh, the type of clickbait thing you you click on with the promise of, uh, you won't believe what this child star looks like today. <laughs> and then it takes you 40 clicks to find out after you go through a bunch of nonsense. Um, I always say to people, I'm, I'm gonna save you five minutes right now. Just go to a search engine and type, what does so-and-so look like today? And you'll, you'll get a picture instantly and don't click on that thing. But, but the point is our business model doesn't drive us in that way. So what is our business? Our business model is, um, you know, every now and then, basically once a year, we pop up a banner saying, you know, could you please chip in for Wikipedia? That's been very, very successful for us. But if you think about, okay, what does that drive you to do as an organization? Well, people better really love you. When they see that thing, they better look at it and go, you know what, this is actually a good thing. Like this is materially good for my life. I'm, I think I'll chip in. And they won't do that if all you're doing is chasing clicks, just like everybody else. They won't do that if they think, yeah, actually, I'm, I'm really concerned my brother-in-law's become radicalized uh, against vaccines because he clicked on too many Wikipedia pages. That, you know, that's not a thing that happens. Um, <laughs> you know, my brother-in-law's qu become quite boring when he drones on and on about Queen Elizabeth I, but uh, that doesn't normally make people hate us. And so, you know, that, that element of things, that advertising piece, not having advertising as our business model really makes a huge difference in terms of how the organization functions, what our goals are, you know, even in a very um, money oriented sense as a nonprofit organization, uh, you still need money to function and the staff are still gonna look at revenue and think about how they can make the organization stable and successful. And then the neutrality piece is, is also uh, incredibly interesting. Um, and, and that is, you know, I, I remember very early on, there was some discussion about whether instead of having one entry on, let's say, abortion, 
controversial topic. Maybe we should have an entry that's written from the Catholic Church point of view and an entry that's written from the Planned Parenthood point of view. And those would stand side by side and then people could maybe vote for them or choose, you know. And I said, no, actually, like what I'd like to see is I'd like to see a kind and thoughtful Catholic priest and a kind and thoughtful Planned Parenthood activist both be able to point to our article on the topic of abortion and say, that's a really good explanation, right? If you read this, you'll know why we don't agree, you'll know what we disagree about. And instead of saying things like abortion is a sin, we'll say uh, the Catholic church position on abortion is such and such and critics have responded thus and so on and so forth. And the idea is for me, it's, that's a, it's got two purposes. And actually most of the rules of Wikipedia I, I view as having these two purposes. One purpose is that's really what I want from a, an epistemological point of view from an encyclopedia. I don't wanna just see one side of the story. I don't wanna be told what to think. I wanna understand the debate. And then I'm a grown up. I can make up my own mind and, and you'll lead me to further information so I can clarify my understanding and so on. And then the other reason is really the social reason. It becomes very, very hard for people to collaborate and cooperate if you're not doing this kind of neutrality. Um, you know, pick, pick any sort of political topic that people disagree about. And it turns out, despite the, the screaming talking heads in the media, most people are pretty reasonable and they understand there are different perspectives on an issue. And if you say, no, we're gonna have the truth with a capital T about whether abortion is good or bad, uh, whether or not it should or shouldn't be banned. Okay, now we've set ourselves up for a, an impossible fight. We know that, that these are intractable issues if you approach them that way. But if you say, no, we're gonna explain that issue. And then a kind and thoughtful, kind and thoughtful is the key piece here, right? Because there are always jerks <laughs> and they're, they're intractable no matter what. And, uh, you know, and, and in fact, one of the issues I have with current social media algorithms is often the jerks uh, get a lot of engagement. Uh, you know, if you tweet something outrageous and obnoxious, people are gonna respond and suddenly you have millions of followers. And if you treat, tweet a nuanced, thoughtful consideration of the issue, that appreciates the complexity, probably you shouldn't be on Twitter, right? That's, that's not the right thing. <laughs> and, and let's, and that actually raises an interesting uh, project that you're working on right now, Jimmy, which is something called WT Social. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that and sure. what you're trying to solve and some of the challenges you've faced with that project? Yeah, so, so WT Social is an outgrowth of Wiki Tribune, um, which, so it's Wiki Tribune Social. Uh, and this is, came about several years ago now when I first started noodling over what's wrong with the media um, and thinking about you know, increasingly hysterical media. Sometimes I agree with it, sometimes I don't, right? Um, and, and, and on that point, I could say, I, I think uh, during the Trump presidency, uh, I think the Washington Post did some fantastic, great journalism but I remember more than once reading a story in the Washington Post and saying, I really agree with this, but frankly, it's just a rant. Right? It's a rant I like, but this isn't what I consider to be thoughtful journalism and news. It's a, it's a rant masquerading as news. So I started working on that problem and, and quickly discovered that I don't think the real problem lies directly with the news media, although there's problems there as well. It's, it's also the environment that they live in. Like if you are um, you know, a newspaper editor, particularly those without paywalls, so the purely ad supported uh, media, you are driven right down that click chasing path in the same way that the social networks are and in part because the social networks are doing it, right? And so, um, so I realized actually what we really need to address is the broader environment. Um, what, what is wrong with this infrastructure? And I think it's always too easy to blame or people, right? So people, that stuff wouldn't be popular if people didn't click on it. Yes, that's true. But I think human beings are complicated. Um, we, we have multi, you know, we have our, um, you know, our reptilian brain that clicks on, you know, tantalizing headlines. But we also have a more Aristotelian reflective uh, part of us that wants to be rewarded and wants to deeply engage and wants to think. And right now that the former is being served very well um, and that can be harmless. I, I actually, I kind of like TikTok. I worry about the future of TikTok, but I mean, if it's just people having fun dancing and it's kind of addictive and fun to look at, that's actually not the worst thing as long as it's not where you get your sort of worldview. But, 
Um, so the idea of what WT Social is say, let's create a new type of social network. Um, and it's pulling together a few different ideas. The, the fundamental though is no, um, no ads, uh, no paywall. So supported purely by donations from the users. Um, and the, the idea there is to say, let's, let's try to think about that business model that Wikipedia has and say, what if we had that type of business model for a social media platform? What, what would that drive you to do? It would drive you to build something that not necessarily people use obsessively all day long in an addictive fashion to see hundreds and hundreds of ads, but something where once a year when, when it's time, they go, you know what? Yes, I use that and I find it's bringing me value in my life, so I'll pay for it. Um, and then uh, the, uh, what was I gonna say? Uh, well, that, that's basically it, that, that's that. And so in terms of the, the, the problems we've had, I mean, basically what we, have, what we struggle with is uh, money, to be honest. Uh, it's a terrible business model, but I, I joke that's how I bought my career so far. So <laughs> terrible business models. Um, but I would like to be able to really invest in improving the site, improving the software. There's a lot of low hanging fruit. Um, I was posting something there yesterday, ran into a bug and I sent it to my developer and he's like, Yes, we have that on our agenda, but we're not going to get to it for a while because I don't have enough people. So that's part of what the purpose of this sale is, is to say, let's actually raise some money um, so that I can push that forward. And it may be a complete failure. I don't know. I've had many failures in my life, but uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm old <laughs> enough now that I'd, I'd rather do something interesting uh, that fails uh, than just go out and make some money. So that's that's really interesting and it also brings up the perhaps the the well, actually what's buzzing these days of course is talk about decentralization in terms of currencies and organizations and what have you but in a lot of ways this is not really anything terribly new in terms of the structure of the internet which started out as a fairly decentralized uh and a, a, a almost anarchic project um and in wikipedia very much uh, benefited from that from that sort of model. And what kind of parallels can we draw from that period where we're coming into the dawn of Web 2.0, as they're calling it now? And of course, mm. we're getting to Web 0.3. What sort of parallels do you see between 20 years ago and what's going on now, especially with cryptocurrencies and decentralized mm. autonomous organizations? Well, I mean, I, it's a fascinating time. Uh, it's a time with a lot of noise. Um, and I think that one of the one of the parallels that I see is that there's a lot of stuff going on that isn't going to work. It's going to be a disaster. People are going to lose money. Uh, same thing happened in the dot com boom. Um, there's bad aspects to that, and that's you know that's a part of how these kind of bubbles and booms happen in technology. And yet, at the same time, there's a lot of really really interesting stuff happening. Uh, sort of new ideas percolating and bubbling. Uh, one of the things that I find most interesting about the NFT space is this, this question around, and we don't know yet, it's too early to know for sure how this is all going to pan out. Um, and I'd love to hear Larry's take on this, and I'll give us a very specific example. So back in the day, uh, let's say 15 years ago, I'm not sure exactly when I was on the board of Creative Commons, but it was some, something like that. Um, I had a, a real idea that collaboration in, in artistic creativity was gonna be really much bigger than it has turned out to be. And the, and the key idea I had was around animation. So there's open source animation software, Blender, there's a Blender Foundation. And I thought we would see some major cultural works come out of that, those free communities where there would be a handful of people who would write the storyline of some sort of anime and the work can be distributed and different people will be working on, on different parts of the art and the music and so on. And they would release it and it would become, you know, sort of one of the mainstays sort of franchises, just like we see from Disney or whatever. That hasn't really happened, not as much as I thought it would. And I think there's some interesting reasons for it because unlike an encyclopedia with a terrible business model, uh, it, there's actually good business model there, right? To say, actually we could create a fantastic property, Creative Commons license completely for free. And um, we could probably sell toys and merchandise uh, and, and different things like that. That's a huge business. And so I'm not sure that the collaboration or the cooperation opportunities have all been sort of solved 
so far. And I'm curious about whether NFTs might provide a certain kind of um, mechanism around that. So what I mean by that, I'll give a different example than, than animation, but I, I, I was in New York recently for the NFT NYC conference and I was invited to a listening party for this Wu-Tang Clan album. So the story here is that Wu-Tang Clan put out an album several years ago and pressed only one copy. And they did it sort of as a protest against the, the predatory practices of the music industry. And they talked a lot about a model of patronage and so on. Turns out it was bought by uh, Martin Shrekley who ended up being like the most hated guy on the internet and uh, ended up going to jail for securities fraud. And then it's been bought now by one of these DAOs, distributed autonomous organizations. But the, the issue is they've got the album, but they're only allowed to play it at private non-commercial listening parties. So they can't actually release it for free. They're really, they're looking really hard at how they might be able to do it. But here's what's interesting. The value of that physical object that they bought only increases to the extent that it's famous. And so for them, if they want to, if they're purely commercial about what they're doing, rather than just thinking this is a cool thing to do and they're like rich people who want to do something cool, if they're being commercial about it, they should say, actually, what we want to do is work out all the rights issues and we want to just release this music for free. And by the way, I think the album's great. So I think that that matters here. Because if they released it for free and it suddenly became a massive hit online and everybody knows about it, then suddenly that one original copy, um, as they've joked, it's the original NFT, becomes even more valuable. And so my question there would be, going back to the, the animation example, could we say, um, sort of tokenize uh, the characters in an anime property? So you own the original drawing of, of this, this thing that you really love. Then suddenly to sell those things and hold a few in reserve for the creators to sell later on as the original, that becomes an interesting business model if it works, if people actually care. And that's sort of, we'll see in a few years time once the the excitement sort of begins to, to fade. So that then the, you could actually fund some of this kind of work that's collaborative, Creative Commons licensed and sold not by restricting access, but sold by being a, a famous thing where you can buy the original copy. Yeah, I, I, I actually think that's a really great idea. We have to be clear though about a couple of principles at its core. Um, but you know, just to make it more tangible, uh, you know, I mean, there there is a painting called the Mona Lisa. It's un, it's priceless. Like you know, obviously the Louvre could sell it for un, unbelievable amounts of money. But there are endless copies of the Mona Lisa available everywhere, and the number of copies available of the Mona Lisa everywhere does not reduce the value of the Mona Lisa. It increases the value of the Mona Lisa. Um, and so that's the potential for, I think, what NFTs could be doing here. There could be the equivalent of the physical copy, that's the NFT. And then the first principle question, the first question of principle is, should you therefore also release a version under a free license? And I think, you know, anybody who believes in free culture should say, yes, absolutely. Yes, you can have your, um, your proprietary copy, the NFT that you own exclusively, but if you're gonna be, you should simultaneously say, here is a digital version of that that's freely licensed for anybody to do whatever they want. I think that's value number one. Value number two is you should not be producing NFTs unless you can be confident that you're using clean energy to do it. Um, or, you know, I think, no, what you've done, Jimmy, with, with your NFT is, is exactly right. You either buy offsets or you use clean energy. But the environmental questions for crypto are significant. and we haven't moved to a proof of uh, stake generally, and we won't for a long time across the wide range of uh, crypto platforms. So we at least have to begin to build infrastructure to have confidence that there's real green energy being used to produce this so that we don't um, create a disaster on the, on the climate side. But I think with those two principles, the, this idea of NFTs is wonderful because it's have your cake and eat it too. Artists can begin to have make money from their creativity, from the trading of the NFTs while supporting free culture because the, the thing that they're producing would be accessible generally. And another example, actually, a real world traditional example that I hadn't thought of until just now uh, is because of you, Peter. Uh, Peter, you are an expert in books, old books, almost all of them that you auction uh, as part of your work at Christie's are public domain by this point. 
Um, and so I would imagine whatever the most expensive book you sold last year was, um, I can probably download a copy online and print it out and read it yes, for okay. free. Right. Yeah, the, works of, the works of William Shakespeare. Yeah, the works <laughs> of William Shakespeare. Yeah. And it's 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 not that, you know, and what gives, why, why would it be the works of William Shakespeare? Because it's incredibly famous. It won't be some obscure book I've never heard of. Um, exactly. And so that idea that the original copy or a signed copy uh, that somehow, it, and this is a really new idea in the digital space. I mean, we've had, uh, uh, you know, we, we've been through this era where it's just natural and it is just natural in the digital space. Like you can just copy things. It's really easy, you know, and the, and the copies are exactly the same as the original. And so it's a bit hard for people to get their head around. What does it mean to have an original or a signed copy? So, so in, 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 yeah. in a certain sense, an NFT brings us as close as we can to that, yeah. basically making it a physical object. Yeah, so, so for my NFT, what I did is I set up the uh, as close a replica as I could to the original software um, that I used on the morning that I, on that January 15th, uh, when Larry was busily filing corporate <laughs> paperwork and I was setting up Wikipedia, uh, the original software, which interestingly, I had to modify a little bit because uh, technology has moved on and it wouldn't actually run correctly at first. I mean, there were a few little things I had to tweak, but one of them that was amusing to me is like, to log in, uh, you had to set a cookie and the cookie was set in the software, hard coded to expire in 2010. So today when you would try to log in as an administrator, it just would say, sorry, you don't have a cookie because your browser instantly deleted it. So I had to make a few tweaks even to get it running. Um, and then, you know, created it as close as possible to how it looked that day. But what I decided to do because it's Wikipedia um, is to not just do a static picture of what Wikipedia looked like to me that day, to actually be, it's editable. So you can change it. The owner can turn the editing on and off. And then it resets itself back to hello world periodically and the owner will be able to set how often they want that to happen. And, you know, for me that, what, what's interesting about that is all of the software is open source. I don't have any copyright over the two words, hello world. I wouldn't <laughs> claim any copyright over something like that. So all the software is open source. So anybody who's uh, watching this could set up their own server with the, the same software, make the same two or three changes, type hello world um, and, and have their own sort of replica of Wikipedia at that moment. Um, and the difference is this one is signed by me. Um, and that's what you can't replicate. Um, and so that, that in that sense, it's, it's sort of my, sort of my work of art, which um, I don't know if that now's the right time to talk about what, what my artistic conception was. And the reason I wanted to do not just a static uh, picture of Wikipedia that day, but because Wikipedia is inherently editable and dynamic, but also wanted people to think about that moment um, and how, in my opinion, none of this was inevitable. Um, I had to make decisions. Um, and I also didn't know. I mean, when I first installed the software, when, by the way, passwords were completely optional at that time. So would this be taken over by trolls and destroyed in three days? Would it be possibly a, an even worse fate is nobody cared and <laughs> nobody came to edit and, and it was just ignored? Um, even as it began to grow, like what are the rules of things we've talked about today that have turned out to be incredibly impactful? Like, is neutrality the right, you know, should I, should I set this up to say, actually on all political topics, it needs to be correct according to me. And so now it's Jimmy's view of the world. No, I decided that's not a, not a great idea. Um, uh, it should be neutral. And, and all of those decisions had to happen. And so it's sort of take you back to that moment and say, look, now you're there and you're me and you've just typed hello world, now what do you do? And I think that's a fun thing to contemplate. And also you're not me, you're the second person to come along. Jimmy typed hello world, what are you gonna do? Um, how can you help or would you help and, and so on? So anyway, um, I just think it's an interesting model because I could have done that a long time ago but it'd just be a website. But now because it's an NFT, it's sort of a way for me to turn a general idea and to say, no, this is a unitary thing a work of art that I've created. And, you know, thinking about that work of art you created, we have, you know, we have this, we have, we do have this, this, this virtual piece, but we also have a physical object. We very yeah. consciously decided we would set the same number 
the physical and the virtual and see which one would end up on top. I believe the physical is currently in the lead. Um, but it also does bring up a question. Does this, you know, the past past 30 years of waiting further and further into this digital world, um, has it perhaps increased our appreciation of the physical and real? And you know, we're starting to see, you know, kids, you know, starting to collect vinyl and things again, and people are starting to get tired of looking at screens and picking up books. It's a good question. I don't know. There was a fun art project that was done a few years ago where somebody uh, created physical books out of Wikipedia uh, and sort of printed out. I, I actually went and visited. There was an exhibit in, in New York City. I went and visited and he actually didn't get it all printed out. Um, most of the books were blank inside, um, but it was quite an impressive uh, display. And it was a fun thing, again, to contemplate, like what would what would it be like if it weren't infinitely large or practically infinite in terms of how much space there is in Wikipedia. What does a physical book mean uh, in this in this modern era? As to the broader question, I mean, it's interesting. So the computer is um, beautiful. Um, it's a strawberry iMac uh, and uh, Christie's have done a great job of taking spectacular photos of it. Uh, and so I, I just think it's interesting and um, you know, what is value? Um, what, you know, and I actually do think around the NFTs, this is, this is one of the things I said from the very beginning is like, a, a physical object that somebody could buy and put into a museum. Um, we sort of all understand the, again, going back to the business model, even if it's a nonprofit museum, the, the business model of a museum is pretty straightforward. You have to have some interesting stuff in a building that people will pay tickets or donors will be happy to support. Um, and then people come and visit it and take a look at it. And that's interesting. And that's true of all museums, traditional museums. And the NFT space is a little bit different because it's not necessarily the same kind of thing. So I'm actually curious to see if some sort of crypto collector would like to buy both and then display the NFT on the computer. That could be kind of fun, um, but we'll see. Uh, it should be noted that the computer uh, starts up once every three times. It is a 20 year old iMac. It comes with all the, uh, <laughs> yes, all the bugs and you expect from an, uh, from an old box like that. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> like the software that I had to patch a little bit, uh, although, the, although the computer has booted, uh, uh, we're not guaranteeing it as a computer, so. Uh, no, we're not. <laughs> we're not just... <laughs> um, and thinking, you know, thinking, um, you know, now you know, we've, we've seen this incredible growth of, of you know, people's engagement online. I think, Larry, when you were writing back in uh, 2004, just about, you know, the, the impact of the internet was having a copyright, you referred to people so talking about, well, you can still, you know, how does, the internet doesn't have to affect us, we can still shut it off. But no, even by 2004, that wasn't a reality. It was affecting every, uh, many aspects of our lives. And now we've become, we've come, especially with, with smartphones and the like, it's become integrated uh, very much in, um, into our lives. Um, now, thinking about that growth of, you know, from 2001 to today, Wikipedia, where do we see the next 20 years of this reference source, especially in this age of increased polarization and, and maybe even the neutral point of view coming under further and further attack? I just, I want to flag, though, an important issue about how it becomes integrated. Um, you know, I think there'd be unambiguous good if Wikipedia became integrated into everybody's life so that they, every single day, connected with Wikipedia. But digital technologies have become integrated in a way which is both good and bad. I mean, it's good in the sense that at any moment I have access to Wikipedia on my, on my iPhone, that's good. But it's bad in the sense that my iPhone is also collecting endless data about me and where I'm going and what I'm doing and what I'm buying. And, and that those data, are sometimes used for good purposes. Like I'm happy that Amazon advertises to me books by people like Jimmy, um, as opposed to books by you know crazy people. Um, but I'm deeply concerned when those data are used by you know Facebook to send people down rabbit holes of craziness. Um, and so what's troubling about the way the network has developed is that we've we've allowed it to develop with this um, kind of bargain with the devil. Uh, privacy dimension, um, and and of course, you know, businesses say that's essential because they say advertising is essential. But see Wikipedia. Um, um, but so long as that's a core part of the architecture, we have a real question about the 
um, how, how uh, eager we should be to see this become integrated in every aspect of our life. Yeah, I mean, what, one of the things I've been happy to see and I'd like to see more of is the reemergence of subscriptions as a model for, for newspapers. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. I don't think it's working. It's working well for the New York Times, for example, because that's a large global brand that people are willing to pay for. It's not really working yet for local news. Um, but I do think, you know, this, this thinking about if the only business model we have is one that really pushes for extracting all this data from us and keeping us addicted, that's a real, that's an issue. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a tough one. It's a really thorny one. So on that happy note. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and where does, you know, uh, in terms of, in terms of the content of Wikipedia, Jimmy, where do you think, uh, I mean, there's lots of places where there's strengths, maybe things that are, maybe some people would think that are overrepresented, there's some people critique the uh, amount of, uh, the amount of content dedicated to pop culture, for instance, but where, where is it lacking in terms of, mm. you know, in terms of information, where could it be improved at this point? Yeah, so I mean, one of the things that we focus on a lot um, at the Wikimedia Foundation and in the community is the increasing the diversity of our editing community. Um, and so uh, what that means primarily, or one of the primary things that means is uh, gender uh, balance in Wikipedia. It's overwhelmingly male, the editors of Wikipedia. Uh, and there's a few different reasons for that, uh, some good, some bad, actually none good, but some neutral, I guess, and, and some bad. Um, but the, the reason for this is that we know, like most Wikipedians write about things that they're interested in and care about. Um, and it turns out that different people from different walks of life are interested and care about different things. Uh, and so we know that we are weaker in, in certain areas. So the classic example that I like to give, uh, somebody did a, a study of award-winning novelists uh, and looking in Wikipedia for female versus male novelist, um, what they found was that the male novelist entries were much longer, which doesn't necessarily mean quality, but it's pretty well correlated, you know, longer, more footnotes and so on. And the reason for that is not, it's not a very simple question of uh, sexism. It's not like the Wikipedia editors just look and say, oh, book by a woman, that's not important, ignore it. It's that people read a book and they love it and they want to learn more about it and they go and read more references about it and, and they read academic papers about it and they contribute to that author's biography. And it turns out there is a, a, a difference in between genders in what people read. I mean, the simplest example um, is a bit stereotypical, but it's true is science fiction. So hard science fiction is much more popular with men than women. That's just a fact about our culture. Uh, so therefore our entries on science fiction as, as much more popular with geeky men, let's just say as well. And we're a bunch of geeky men. So our entries about, you know, authors in hard science fiction are incredibly good. And our entries uh, for, you know, novelists who appeal more to women are not as good because we don't have as many e women editing. And this is kind of across the board. We see this kind of effect in lots and lots of places. I mean, things like if you look uh, across the different languages uh, people have done looking at the uh, geotag. So most locations in Wikipedia. So if you go to the entry on the Eiffel Tower, you may not have ever noticed it, but it'll be geotagged with the GPS coordinates of where the Eiffel Tower is. So then you can go to each language of Wikipedia and say, how, how is their coverage look globally? And some of it's kind of obvious and not particularly interesting. Uh, it turns out German Wikipedia has a lot more coverage of places in Germany than um, say English Wikipedia or Japanese Wikipedia. And that's natural, right? German people write about German things. And so that's natural. But where you can really see the problem is uh, things that are clearly areas where we need to understand each other in the world much better. And if English Wikipedia has very, very poor coverage of the largest cities in Africa and the, the local places within those cities, that's, that's actually a problem for us. We, we would like to see uh, much more diversity across all parts of Wikipedia. So it's, that, one's, that one's a little nuanced because you, you say, okay, 
right, well, if Thai Wikipedia has more stuff about Thailand, that's kind of okay and, and not a big deal. But I'm, I'm sort of like, yeah, but wouldn't it be great if all the Wikipedias had that much stuff about Thailand? You know, isn't that where we want to go? And it is where we want to go. And there's a lot of great efforts in the community and uh, people who are working on those things. But for me, that's, that, that's really what the future of Wikipedia uh, for us looks like. It's like, how do we grow in the languages of the developing world? How do we get to what we call knowledge equity, um, where we, are, we have more people participating who aren't all sort of, I, I, I always, people say, oh, it's just geeky white men. And I'm like, yeah, but obviously you haven't met the Japanese Wikipedians, but point taken. <laughs> in English Wikipedia, it's, it's geeky white men. In, in Japanese Wikipedia, it's, it's geeky Japanese men, but um, the point is still broadly correct. And we do see this throughout all the language groups. We see the same sort of skewing towards towards male contributors, correct? Yeah, I don't, I don't know of any, any language that doesn't have it. Um, I, I, obviously, it's going to be better or worse in certain parts of the world. Um, I don't ha actually have any numbers off the top of my head uh, to, to know for sure, but um, yeah. Well, I think we are getting close to the end of our session. We don't have, uh, if anyone has any questions, please uh, bring them up now. Um, otherwise, I think uh, I would like to thank our, our panelists, uh, Dr. Lessing and Mr. Wales, or Jimmy and Larry, as we like to say. Um, thank you again for joining us for this fascinating discussion. Uh, I believe we could probably you know, blather on for another couple of hours if given the, if given the ability to do so, but we all do have places to go and things to see. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that uh, the Bertha Wikipedia, our online sale at chrissies.com, uh, will be closing next Wednesday at 2 p.m. Uh, New York time. Uh, that'll be that's Wednesday on the 15th of December. So on behalf of, of everyone here at Chrissy's, I just want to thank you uh, again for joining us. And I do hope we can do it again someday. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Larry. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Really great. All right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>